So good Monday morning, everyone. Thanks for coming so early on a Monday morning. Um, I, I'm obviously not Prashant Chinoy, as you might have figured out. Uh, my name is Mike Zing. Um, Prashant asked me to give a guest lecture today because from what I understand, he's traveling um, today. And so um, he asked me you know, to talk a little bit about multimedia streaming. Um, that is um, also a very important topic in the area of distributed systems. Anyone of you listening to NPR this morning? National Public Radio here? They actually had a story about you know, how Hulu and Netflix and all the others try to now get um, customers, regular TV viewers, over to hooked to their services to kind of you know, have them subscribe and so on. So it's a topic that even makes um, the news, the regular news these days. So it's a very important topic. And I'll give, elaborate on this a little bit more. I'm actually a professor over in the ECE department. Uh, before I took on the position there, I've actually been a uh, research scientist and a research professor here in the computer science uh, department. Some of you might know me. Um, I know a bunch of the people working here, including Prashant, uh, very well. So what I wanted to start with is give you an idea, actually, um, what, are the, you know, what are the, strain, the constraints we're putting on systems when we talk about multimedia streaming? Uh, and, you know, the most challenging is really video in this case, right? So if you look at... What I have on here, I hope you can read this all fine. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to mention, I forgot before. Um, please just you know, interrupt me any time if you have any questions. Right? I would like to keep this as interactive as possible. If something is not clear, if you want to elaborate on something, have more background, would like to have more background information, in addition to what I'm showing you on the slides or what I'm saying, just you know, ask, please. Um, so you know, we have um, the, the data demands and the data itself are much higher than what we uh, are usually used with with other uh, you know, applications. So if you look at the storage requirements, for example, for multimedia streams, if we look at 4,000 movies, just assume they're all kind of you know, standard movie size lengths of an hour and a half, um, DVD size, 10 Mbps uh, DVD size, we need a storage of something of the order of 27 terabytes. If we go to 50 Mbps, we have 40.5 terabytes of storage. 36 Mbps, Blu-ray standard these days, 97.2 terabytes, right? So, so it's, it's quite, just from the storage side, there's a lot of storage we need just to store uh, 4,000 movies, right? If you know, looking at these libraries these days, there's a lot of movies that services like Hulu and Netflix offer, so we need quite a piece, a piece of storage just in case. If you look at 2,000 CDs, on the audio side, it's a little lower, it's a 1.4 terabyte, right? So I'll, just alone from the storage side, there's quite a bit of uh, demand, and it, it puts a lot of load on the system. And then if, if you continue to look um, further, you know, with, um, on the I.O. side, if the service is very popular, you have many concurrent clients that are connecting to the service. That they want most likely a variety of different streams from the system, right? So there's a quite a bit of load on the I.O. side of the server. As we know from streaming, but it's very different to just FTP download, web page download. It's real time. Right? If we don't get information to the client at a certain point in time, it's useless. Right? We want to show a video with a certain frame rate. 30 frames per second is, for example, the standard. Right? If we don't get all the information um, of, for the next frame on time, we have large disruptions. We can use, we can, we can deal with some tolerance, right? loss tolerance, so we can use a certain fraction of data, and it still shows, you've probably seen that sometimes when you get this blockiness, uh, when you watch a movie that's, for example, MPEG encoded, right? So you can lose some of the information, but you cannot have it that all the information for a frame comes too late, because then it's worthless. Or you have to buffer, which you often, very often see these days by using these services, right? So um, we want continuous play out. Um, so as you can see, we need very high data rates, right? If we want to continuously play out a DVD, say we don't apply any compression or whatever, we need data rates on the order of 10 megabits per second, right? Very different again from what we usually see. A Blu-ray is even higher. And then if we look at the capabilities, right, this is maybe not totally up to date, but pretty, very recent. We have a you know, mechanical disk, 400 megabits per second um, um, rate, and um, SSD RAM, SD RAM hard, no, uh, solid state disk, up to one gigabit per second of our frame rate, right? And then network, well, you know, traditionally we have one to ten. We get, have even forty to one hundred gigabit, gigabit interfaces these days. But the, the hundred ones are crazily expensive. They're usually used in the core backbone and not on servers, and, and absolutely not on clients, right? 
And then the buses, as you can see, we have eight gigabits on PCI and up to 64 on, on, on the PCI Express. Um, so that's kind of, you know, when you look at the, the stream of getting the data from the server out um, into the network, right? And there's a lot of constraints on, on the system itself. And then that doesn't include that you have any real, any computing in real time. So that you don't have any other um, computation running. So everything else, like encryption, adaptation, transcoding, has to also be, has to also happen in, in real time. So if you would do that, that would be even increase it more. Encryption, sometimes you know you want to encrypt a video, so only someone, only a viewer with a key on the other side can actually watch that video, right? We don't want, you know, there's copyrights and all this. Adaptation, sometimes, <clears throat> you know, since bandwidth is not guaranteed at a certain level, you might want to change the quality layers. And then transcoding is another way of, you know, changing it from one format to another format, depending on what, you know, capabilities of viewer has with the client, if it's a mobile phone, for example, smartphone, or if it's a desktop, or if it's even an internet connected TV with, with, with a much higher resolution. This all has to happen in real time, right? If this doesn't work in real time, we don't get the quality we expect. And so um, this is kind of a little bit of an uphill battle here, right? So uh, it's a lot of, uh, you know, challenges here on, on the system. Right? So um, what I want to talk you to, to you about is give a short overview on multimedia servers. There's been a ton of work in this, in this area in, in the recent history. Um, but what I want to do is, after looking at the servers, I want to look a little bit more uh, and take a look at the system, right? And tell you what we did over the past years to analyze you know, traffic uh, and demands for these systems and what we can learn from that to improve the system, right? With, with different uh, technologies by using caching, prefetching, and then even look at the recommendation systems. How can we use the information that we get? You know, all these online services have recommendation systems. They tell you what you might want to watch, right? They have lists where you show this might be of interest for you, um, how you can use that uh, to improve the system's performance. Since these systems are very, very popular, um, we really use, or what's, what's used for these services is really distributed architecture, right? Um, shouldn't be anything new to you. I'm pretty sure you have to, uh, you have heard about this, uh, what you call, you know, it's kind of a several tiers where you have the top tier, which are the master servers or the origin servers. And then you have a um, distribution architecture with regional servers. Sometimes they're also called maybe top tier caches and lower tier caches, right? So they're, they're, they're having cache functionality, and then you have local servers, and then we have the end systems on, on the bottom of the chain. So it's a distribution system, which we often see for all kinds of uh, you know, applications in the internet to make it scalable. We see this for um, you know, regular uh, web traffic, regular web data, web applications. And we have seen that companies like Akamai actually um, made it their core business to offer this distributed, distributing system. They sit between the origin servers and the master servers and the viewers and provide this kind of um, you know, distribution here with the, with, the, with, the, with the intermediary servers in, in between. So um, we, have, we have the origin servers, we have the um, proxy servers, and then um, the, the viewers down below. And th there's a lot of dynamics happening here, right? Because what we originally want to do is we want, a piece of, we want to place a piece of content as close to the view as possible. Any idea why? Latency issues. Other ideas? Cost to transmit? Cost to transmit, right? Bandwidth consumption, right? If, if someone like Comcast can keep the data in their residential network, right? They don't have to pay for the bandwidth usage up here or don't have to get a bigger pipe into the core internet, right? So if you can keep it as low as possible, that's kind of preferable. So if you know, you know what, if you could, if you could take your hourglass and could predict into the future what these user, users here uh, are going to watch, right, then you can actually do a very good job. Unfortunately, that's not really 100% possible, right? So, um, um, you know, there's this, this, this this focus on like how popular is our data, and then you know also sometimes um, this is a high level view of this hierarchy. There's different variations of this hierarchy, all the way down to being able to use peer to peer services as a distribution mechanism. Right? Uh, we've seen that for some of the live streaming services, some other uh, services.
So um, when we look at you know the servers, the hierarchy, let's take a quick look at the single server. And that's something that can I can I shut the lights in front a little bit up? I hope it's a bit. Better? Yeah. Does that work with the camera? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so you know, you go, you guys. I think I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know all of, about our rating systems. Um, when, when we look at the path uh, for for retrieving data, right? We go from the file system to the application to the communication system, and often we have to go from current space into user space and back into current space to get to get a video out of um, to the network, assuming. There's a kind of video that's stored stored on the disk, right? And now let's see this. Now think of this as is happening a hundred times, a thousand times, you know, because we have a lot of load on, on a lot of viewers wanting to watch this video. So you can see that this puts a lot of um, stress on the system, so on a, on a server, so to speak. And um, you um, can can optimize a lot of these things uh, depending on the um, you know on, on, on the application here. Um, this has gone all the way down to people looking at file systems, right? There's a lot of research, for example, on multimedia file systems. Actually, Boshan has done some work uh, a few years back on, in, in this area, right? So how can you optimize file systems based on multimedia is one thing. How do you do searches? How do you, you know, uh, collect the data from the disk is, is one of the things. Another one is actually memory, right? Because you put some of that into your memory before you put it out in the communication system. Right? It's not in your memory, in the computer's memory. <laughs> And so um, there are important things uh, to think about, and they are always uh, under, the con under the constraint of having to do this in real time, right? Even the slightest delay can have some impacts on the quality of the user experiences when he or she watches the video, right? And what we're not showing is actually what's happening all the way down here on the network, right? We're, we're, not, even, we're not even focusing on that. Um, so the server internal challenges are actually um, the data retriever from the disk, right? And then there's the, the important resources here are the memory, the buses, the CPU, um, the storage system, and the communication system. Right? So these are all the systems that you uh, that, that have to be uh, looked at when you look at multimedia streaming servers. And if you're interested, there's, there's a lot of work um, out there. I don't want to go in all, in all this detail. So one example uh, that have people have been looking at is, for example, to um, Maybe not being having to go into the application and not changing over into the user space, right? So um, there's work on can you actually go by putting uh, by packaging, you know, your your data into whatever protocol format you're sending out here in the kernel, right? Because you then you then you save that context switch. Right? Um, doing certain things of you know we will talk about caches in a distributed way. But even what kind of information do you cache in your memory locally on your server? If you know again about you know, certain request patterns of, of the viewers, you can keep certain information in your, in your memory. Right? Why flash, flash your memory if, if it's needed again in 10 seconds or so on? Right? So these are the things uh, researchers focus on in, in, the terms of, in the terms of multimedia service, the service alone. Um, so a lot can be done by optimizing the resource utilization. Um, and so, if you look at this, when we look at the timeliness, right? So what I want to show you here is actually we see time on the x-axis, and then we see the data offset for just one video here, right? So depending on what you have, um, what kind of format you have, when you start at T1, this is when you want to watch your video, right? You start the play button. Um, you have a play out, right? So sometimes you have a variable bit rate. Some videos have a variable bit rate, so your, 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 your play out rate varies over time. Right? It depends on the encoding form. Other times, you have a constant bit rate. Right? Let's just go with the constant bit rate of S in this example because it's a little bit more straightforward. So you have a constant bit rate. This is how you ideally want to play out the video. This is on the client side. This is on your computer, on your TV, on your smartphone. Right? <clears throat> and so if you look at this data offset, now you can, you can go backwards. right? You can say, if you want to do this, you must start retrieving the data a bit earlier. Right? If you now start retrieving the data, you will have a delay. Right? So, so you know, um, if you look at the network part, right? Oops, I'm going fast. 
you look at the network part, it might be that your data is actually coming through the pipe in, the, in, in such a fashion. Right? So what you need is actually you have to start doing this, start the streaming at the server side a little bit earlier, right? And then buffer uh, on the client side to smooth out some of these effects. Right? And then what comes in addition is actually um, the um, descending, right? So, so you know, here's this assumption. Let me just finish that because then we have everything on there, right? So here the assumption is, well, you know, there's some changes through the network, but it's very similar. It's, it's, but it could be, these two lines could be quite significantly different, right? Based on what's happening in, in the routers and the links in between. And then you have the send function and your reach function. And again, between the reach function and the send function, um, they might, it's not constant, right? It, depending on how much load is on the server, that might change over time. So kind of, you can work backwards from that, right? Based on some information you have, if you want to play out where you're at T1, you can actually see when you would have to start reading that information. Right? So since we cannot actually see that, foresee that, we always see that there's a little bit delay by all the services we're using today, right? We always get a little clock or a little buffer or something like this until things start, right? This, this is because it takes some time to get things off, off the server. You want to have, you have to buffer a little bit to smooth out some of the networking effects, right? So that's that's what's happening, right? So so kind of you know when you when you would design such a system, one second, you have to look into this kind of effects. Yes, please. Okay. So considering this slide in the previous one, it seems that uh, the time between reading from the file system and sending is just a fraction of the uh, entire delay you put to start playing. Yeah. So it, it seems that even if you were able to directly send from the file system to the um, network card, mm -hmm. if you can by bypass this part of going to the user mode, um, you're actually just gaining a, like a little latency in terms of one particular video. Mm -hmm. But uh, perhaps the real advantage of doing that is that you're able to deal with more uh, like streams at the same time. Yeah. Rather than yeah. So, so, well, just to illustrate this, I would take one example, but you now have to think of the server handling hundreds or thousands of requests, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely right. And that's that's where you have to, for one, it looks, for one video, the improvement looks looks small, yeah. almost negligible, but if you, if you take the bigger sum, then you get the real big, mm -hmm. right? So that's also like when we look at distribution architectures, right? We don't need, uh, we wouldn't need a dis distribution architecture if we had 10 users, so, so we could all serve, easily serve that from one server. But now we have millions of users, we really need that distributed architecture with the caches and the, the, the other servers in between and the different architectures. Okay, very good question. Any other questions on that side? So now I want to I want to <coughs> mention a couple more things. Um, number one is um, this is becoming more and more important, not only on the on the video streaming side, but this is also important is games, even more because games are interactive, right? So you have to delay both ways because the clients are, you know, if you have like a first person shooter game or something, it's they're playing against each other. The information has to go to the server and come back to the clients again, right? So this is one, one, one part where this is also becoming important. So when I talk about multimedia, I always pick video as an example, or as the example, but there's a bunch of other multimedia applications where this is equivalently important. Another thing is actually, this now <coughs> gets, um, um, you know, um, together with what, what, what's happening in cloud computing. You guys know OnLive? Have you heard of OnLive as a service? It's actually a game, they do games. One of the more interesting examples I found recently is actually they now, <clears throat> what they do is they run, an, they run a Microsoft desktop for you in the cloud and you can use that on your iPad. <laughs> well, my iPad's OS X, right? So how's this working? What they do is they run the whole Microsoft OS and like Word and, and PowerPoint and all these applications on a VM in the cloud. And the only thing they, they do is they stream the video frames of that image of that, of that screen output to the client. So I don't do any calculations. I just get new frames and you know the mouse commands and all this stuff gets sent back. Imagine again latency and so on are really, really critical here because it makes your <coughs> experience um, very, very different. So um, streaming also becomes important now where cloud applications are used for thin clients, right? Where you don't really have any comp high computational capability 
on the end user side. And the last application, I think that's going to take off quite a bit pretty soon, since we're seeing you know 3D TVs, 3D movies coming out is really like 3D streaming. And depending on how the 3D uh, 3D streaming is realized, you see that the bandwidth even goes more up, right? goes up more because you have more data. Sometimes you have 3D approaches where you have different viewing angles, more streams that have to be transported, right? So this is a topic that you know will probably be of high interest for a long, long time because there's more applications, there's more challenges through new formats going on. So with that, <clears throat> I want to stop here and see if you guys have any questions before I went, go on to the next topic. Okay, so um, I want to give you a little bit of an example on the challenges and <clears throat> in the system design when you look at uh, multimedia streaming systems by presenting you some of the work we did in the past years. And so what we are looking at is actually um, YouTube, right? And why I want to talk about YouTube is actually because it's a little bit of a different animal, right? There's a new challenge. Why is YouTube a, new, a different animal than the other services? Any idea? Who makes the content that's on YouTube? Users, users right? It's not, it's not um, Steve Lu uh, uh, Lucas Films and Disney and, and the big produ producer. Not not always, right? There's some special needs they have, but it's basically you and I, right? <clears throat> and what is different with that when it comes to scheduling? No one actually knows when con new content is made public, right? So it's really, really hard to predict what's going to be popular in the next hour. With a service like Netflix or Hulu, it's a different story because they, Netflix and Hulu, determine what's been available over their streaming services. So they know in advance when they put a new, new movie out, right? So I could imagine if Netflix, for example, puts one of the movies out that won an Oscar, um, they know this is going to be probably pretty popular. There's actually now, there's a site, I think it's called Head Hacking Netflix, that actually gives you for each week the new movies Netflix is going to be put on streaming, right? So people know that. And so Netflix know that this will be most likely very popular. So they can pre-distribute that, these videos, in their hierarchy. With YouTube, it's pretty much not possible, right? Because I can put, I could, you know, Sean could go and put this online with, with what you guys are just recording here right now, next, next, in an hour, I would say, right? It's probably not going to be that popular, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but, but, you know, who knows what, you know, what, what, what's going to be popular, right? So there's, there's, a, really, there's a pretty a big challenge. So, so our, our distributing systems, as the ones I showed you before with, with the different hierarchies and the caches in between, actually have any help, right? So what we, what we wanted to do is actually we wanted to actually see what's happening today for it, when we did this measurement with YouTube and, and observe and then see if we can, based on the obser observations we have, if we can make any improvement. <coughs> um, so just a quick overview here. Um, I'll, I'll give you a quick motivation on that and then tell you about the measurements we performed and then how we use these measurements to look in certain distribution infrastructures and uh, what we can take away from it. From it right? So, um, in, you know, it's probably, this is a little bit of an older number, but you, you guys know it by, by uh, yourselves. This is a very popular service, right? There's, there's um, I think now it's, it's like, I don't know how many videos I've watched. I, I have it somewhere, the exact numbers, but there's this incredible high number of videos being watched on YouTube every day. There's even a, a very surprising high number of new videos put online every day by the users, right? So this is a very, very popular service which puts, puts a lot of load onto the system. As I mentioned before, it's very different from traditional video on demand because, of, because it's user generated, right? So we, it's, it's hard to predict. Um, <clears throat> what we were, what we were uh, looking into is actually, how is actually the access from a campus network, right? Well, there's two reasons for that, why we wanted to do that. Number one is we had a, we had a, we had a means of monitoring the traffic going in and out from this campus here. And the second one is actually we wanted to get a local idea. Why did we want to get a local idea? Well, globally, you can get at least some idea about the YouTube popularity. How can you get it globally? Go to the test page. Right. You can go to and use or use the API 
and look at the views, right? So theoretically, you could even like um, um, go through all of the all of the videos that are available, right? And look at the popularity of the views and kind of have a popularity ranking. Right? It's pretty te tedious because you had to crawl millions of videos these days, but but it's pop it's possible. And actually, some researchers um, from Korea and Telefonica and Spain had actually done that before. So they had there was some global idea, but as I showed you before on that picture, right, we are kind of interested in getting the content close to, as close to the user as possible. So maybe the global information is not necessarily what you want. You want to have some information about what's happening on the local link, so to speak, right? Because that's where you have the most impact, right? And so what we also wanted to do is um, we wanted to compare that then to the, our data with the global um, uh, popularity that has been already reported by others. So. Methodologies, monitoring YouTube traffic at the campus gateway, um, obtain the global popularity, look at the video clip traffic that's actually generated. So we did a little bit of statistic, statistic analysis on that. And then do trace-driven simulations for various content distribution aspects, uh, approaches. What are trace-driven simulations? You, instead of, you know, for many simulations, you use stochastic um, approaches to, to generate your data. You, Assume like you know, Poisson arrival rate or something. Else. What we did here is actually we used the information we had from our measurement data. We used that as input for our simulations, and I'll give you a couple of details on that um, later. So what we did is here. First of all, we had to re-engineer YouTube a little bit. We had to figure out how does it really work to to make sense out of the measurement information. Right? So what's happening is, um, you know, a client gets goes to the YouTube page. There's a get message. What you get back is actually, when it comes to the streaming, you get a redirect message from the web server to a content server, right? With that redirect message, you then actually get the actual video stream, right? So what we were interested in is, is, is this kind of you know, information flow at these messages, because with that, we could see what client is requesting what video at what time, right? That's, that was the important part. And, um, we have a, so this is just an example of the message. I think this is not too important. But what we had for the longest time is actually a monitoring box on one of the gateways between this campus and the internet. Right? So we could see all the traffic that's going in and out. I always say that, no worries. We have an agreement or we have, you know, OIT uh, makes us anonymizing that information. So, you know, these, all these IP addresses are anonymized and so, um, we just can, can uh, make conclusions on, on, on the average side, but we have no individual information. Okay? So this is kind of the process we set up here. And so we, we started monitoring this traffic. And um, when, we, um, when we get this, you know, the, the scape and the redirect information, uh, we use that and analyze that information. And so um, what we looked at is the duration of the streaming session, the average data rate, and the amount of transfer of payloads in addition to um, the requests and what content has been requested. So what you see here, we took the three different traces. You see this is a couple of years back. Um, oops, something is, I'm looking forward in the year 22. No, <laughs> something is wrong with the format here. So this was all 2008, 2009, right? Um, and um, what you can see here, we took um, different different length traces just to see you know if how how things change if we look at length, longer or shorter time periods and you see here the different unique clients we could identify in our traces we could see the to the, the amount of different videos that we requested videos that were only request requested only once during that time and then videos that were requested multiple times right so if you have video A and it was only requested once during this 12 hour period, it goes in here. If you have video B and it requested, was requested, for example, two or three times, it goes in here. Right? And so here's the first interesting result. We see, look at this a ratio here, right? So no matter what the length of our trace is, right? That, you know, there's a, there's a couple of dots behind that. Let me show those. It's, it's pretty much similar. So that's, that's one interesting uh, um, observation we made. Number two is, 
there's only so much you can actually do with caching, right? Why? Because it's so many words to cache. Yeah, right. So this is one of the big problems for, for YouTube, for example, right? There's only a little bit, there's, there's a lot of, uh, of, of, of clips that are requested once. So then, uh, you know, this is, this is on a high level. We also looked a little bit closer into the into these three streams. So what you see here is actually the number of requests uh, on, and, uh, over the um, cumulative CDF here, and you can see you can see here there's a lot of requested on a lot of the requested only requested once, uh, and then you see that there's a, there's like one here that has. Um, Maybe 80, what is this? This is 10, 10, 10, 30. No, only 40, right? So there's a couple of videos that have like in the 10th, or I think we got some here. Yeah, here in the later cases, we had some that were, there's one that was that almost 100 requests during the same, at the same video, right? So here you see the distribution for, 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 the, for the different videos. So you can see there's a, there's a high portion for videos that are requested only once, and then there's uh, another one, uh, another section of videos that are requested um, um, multiple times, and you clearly see um, along. You know, if you if you turn it around, you see, you'd see if you did a regular CDF, you'd see uh, quite a long tail distribution. Actually, I, I think I have another graph. Then you see it here a little bit better. <coughs> well, it's still not turned around, but what you see here is actually um, the number of requests. And then we have the request per video over the all over all of the the request per video over all requests, right? And again, you see here that there's the single requests is very high, and then you know you see how there's multiple requests here, but really requests in the high numbers you have um, you have only only very small portions here, right? Okay. And then you see here the outlier where we had someone just push somehow. This video was watched 140 times on campus in the industry. Go ahead. Uh, you have any statistics yeah. uh, you tried to do with that uh, over uh, all requests or over all videos? Uh, over requests per video stats? Yeah. Okay, so. It's not over all videos. Um, so, what proportion of all requests are repeated? Uh, repeated though? Um, it's a good you question. Know, I don't have. I have it in the paper. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I have it in the paper. I would have to look it up to be honest. I know I have it. I don't know why we didn't put it on here. It's not on the slides here, but it's it's in the paper. We'd have to look that up. I'm, I don't have that in my head. Um, I th but it would be a little bit higher. Um, so, so then we, you know, we had our local results, and we made some observations. So, uh, what we did is um, we we um, went and looked at, you know, how. Uh, what's the popularity of these videos we saw in these traces, right? So, so the nice thing is when, when you get a video, when you, when you monitor a video request to YouTube, uh, you always see this uh, identical hash they use for that video, right? So you can actually, and you can actually use that hash. If you copy that hash and put it into YouTube, it actually shows you the actual, it finds the actual video. So with that, you could actually also look at the API and find the global popularity. And then we rank the video not amongst all the videos, but with all this, with the set of we just said had requested from our network and rank them. And globally, uh, rank them on the global data and then on our local data and compared uh, the correlation and we couldn't find any correlation between them. So that was an interesting result for us because if you wanna do a good job on caching, the global popularity is not necessarily very helpful because there's no correlation. So you couldn't go and say, so someone requests a video, right? Your cache is already full and now you, what you could initially think of is uh, well, let me let me let me look up what the global popularity of this video is based on the information YouTube provides me, to see if I should cache that video or not. Right? If the global popularity is high and we had a strong correlation, then it would make maybe it would most likely make sense to cache it and replace an older video with that new video. But since there is no correlation, it doesn't really it's not really that bad. Right? Um, as I mentioned, either the length of uh, the measurement or number of clients uh, seem to have an effect on the local popularity. And then we found a couple videos, like if you go to this link, this shows something happening at UMass on the UMass campus. For sure, you know, it's probably not a total surprise that videos with local um, relation um, have um, a higher, had higher popularity, uh, for sure. Uh, probably, you know, if you look, would now, if we would now look at the 
you know, the university starts making these little, little video clips to promote the university and stuff like that might be, might have a higher popularity, which is absolutely, uh, uh, makes absolute sense, but it, again, is not reflected in global popularity because our, compu our campus population is a lot smaller than, you know, the whole population of, of, of watchers, uh, YouTube watchers. So uh, we did <coughs> a couple more things, and so what we looked here is actually um, where um, the request for client, right? So, so here's some of the information we were looking for, not, not, not directly. Um, so this is the, the, the videos we had with, with multiple requests from the same client. Right? We were also interested in um, who gets um, multiple requests from the same client. Uh, and here's our total number of requests. And so we had a, we looked at, you know, how many requests, uh, how, what's the maximum number of requests from the same client. Um, and so here you can actually see um, the distribution. And you see again a couple, there's, there's one client that was very active, and then you see a lot of clients that just watch one, one video. Right? And so you see this for all the three cases. That's not uh, very different. So uh, we, we, we had all this information, and now we thought, we, we looked at, so what, what, how, how can we actually, what would caching actually improve, right? How can we, can we use uh, something that would really cache this information? Um, and we looked at two approaches, peer-to-peer um, -peer and uh, proxy caching. So we took the information from the traces, and then we created our own simulator and ran simulations on it and see how this, how this would, you know, how caching would be good. So before we, we, before we could do that, what we also wanted to do is uh, we, wanted, uh, we wanted to use the stream uh, flow analysis to um, make our sim uh, simulation as, real as, as realistic as possible by getting some information about the duration of the videos that were uh, requested, the number of packets, the payload size, and the rate to use as with this, 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 this with the stream simulator, right? So now we, we know how long a video um, um, this, this watch right would kind of make sense, right? So the average length is like a minute and a half, something like this, right? Because they're very short clips. There's actually some very long ones and some, you know, some are just still images, some very short ones. Um, here's the number of packets. Here's the payload size, right? So you have an idea. This is very important because if you want to simulate caches, then you know how much storage you need or how much space you have available or not available or then you have to replace information on the cache because there's not enough space anymore. And then there's, there's the, the rate we were just interested in, how a video gets stuff. So the first approach we looked at is actually peer-to-peer -peer approach, right? So no cache, go ahead. Could you go back one? Yeah, sure. So is this table just to illustrate what the data looks like? Mm -hmm. Or do you really use the, the requests in, in the trace? We, we, we use the requests in the trace. Okay. But we use the requests in the trace most with basically this information, right? So when I request a video and I, I, I simulate caching, right? I know the time when it has been requested, when the initial request has made. Imagine now my cache is empty. I say, okay, this is video is, is, is goes through the cache to the user, so it's cached. So I need, you know, at least this average amount of, of storage. Or if we have the individual information, we can say we need that amount of storage on the cache. So that's what we track in our simulation. Now the cache fills up, and now I have to replace things. Right? So if I take one video off, I get so much free space. But, but, but can I store the new video on there? Right? So that's how we, how we do that. Does that answer your question? Um, I, I'm afraid I didn't understand. Why do you need the average? Why, why don't you just use the payload size of the particular video that was requested instead of the average? Oh, this is just for statistical. We we just did the the average for for uh, illustrate yeah to, okay. to, for you know just to get an idea what the average is of these videos right um, we I think we used the individual payload size in the simulation right okay so f the first one we looked at what um, what what happens if we if we don't have any infrastructure if we don't use a cache the only thing we do is actually we assume that a client watches a video right oops and then would store that video, right? Let's say video A, for example, and then client B at time t plus x, but then if he or she were interested in the same video, could get it from that client, right? So what we did is actually, since we knew when 
the client A requested that video. We had this time information from our trace, right? We did a simulation where we said, okay, let's just assume that this client is has a 30-minute window where it's active, right, where it's up. Because what we don't know in PHP Assistant is actually how long is this client going to be on, right? And so based on that, uh, we, did, we did a simulation. Again, we wrote our own simulator. And as you can see, based on these different traces, uh, when, we, when we look at, we show the x-axis here, how much of data, of caching space we make available at each client, you can actually see how um, the hit rate improves, right? Hit rate is actually how many of the videos that are requested multiple times after the initial time can be served from one of the clients in the local network in this case, right? So you don't have any traffic going outside your network, outside your local network. And so you can see actually that you, um, <coughs> that you have um, a little bit of, of improvement. For sure, you cannot go above the theoretical maximum of the 23% we had shown in the, in, the original case, in the original analysis, but you can see how that actually can, can improve um, your hit rate and so reduce the traffic going coming from the outside. And hopefully also um, improving the disk viewer's performance because it's less delayed, it's less prone to loss and all the stuff that's not going across uh, the backbone income. So um, that's, that's what we see here. And, and as you can see, um, so this is actually, you know, from a gigabyte of space on it, kind of all these, all these uh, the graphs level out, right? the different slopes level out. So if every user would, would, uh, would um, donate a gigabyte of space, the system would get, get, get the highest hit rate. Now, you know, there's this. There's already quite a bit of controversy of users would really do that. So we said, well, why don't we look at the diff next scenario where we really had a proxy cache on the gateway. On the, so everyone from the network could be served from that cache. Um, here we just did a real simple FIFO replacement. So when the cache was full, whatever came in first goes out first to make space for new requests that should be made. And so <clears throat> here you see these different traces. And so um, here we could go up. Um, um, you know, you, could, you can see that how you can improve the, the hit rate. Um, and what you see is actually um, we need a much bigger cache size, but this is a gigabyte, right? This is a terabyte. So if you have, is that correct? Yep, right? Um, so, so, you know, you, even with a terabyte, you could go over 20% hit rate, so to speak. So in a terabyte, it's not really something where it's expensive these days, right? So you can, if you put a cache on, on, on the, into the local network, you can get, uh, um, oh no, this is, this is megabytes, sorry, I was wrong, right? This is 100 megabytes, this is a gigabyte. What? Now I confuse myself. This is a 100 meg. This is a gig. This is 10 gig. And this, so sorry, I was totally off. So 100 gig is actually what what you need, right? So this is not much, right? This is would be a very simple piece of uh, very cheap piece of equipment. I would install that to get this uh, effects with caching. Now, since then, we didn't know that in 2009, but if you check now, there's a Google cache on our campus, right? So Google is actually doing this by now. They're putting actually, you know, Google owns YouTube, right? They're actually putting caches in different locations to improve their streaming service. I think they use it also for searches and mails and maybe other stuff also, right? So, but we couldn't, we didn't see that behavior actually um, in 2009. So how did we come across that? When we did recent measurements with local clients, all of a sudden we got a campus IP where the videos are served from, right? And so that made us realize there's something in, in between now <laughs> that is doing that, okay? Um, so that, that are the results we got uh, for this case. Um, there was actually work in this area had been before, so I told you about the guys who did the global measurement. That uh, was presented at IMC in 2007, and then at uh, IMC 2007, there was also um, uh, some people out of uh, uh, Simon Fraser, I guess, that did some work, <coughs> but um, they could only uh, um, monitor a predefined set of, U of YouTube servers. 
you could you could really do a measurement all across the board. So the measurement was uh, a, a, a little bit uh, limited, and then none of them had done actually simulate any simulated studies. Okay. So um, you know I think we showed that there's no strong correlations between the global and the local popularity. Um, we showed, we showed that the measurement doesn't have any impact. The length of the measurement doesn't have any impact on, on the results and the number of users available. We showed that video clips of local um, uh, interests have a high popularity. And we looked at the different uh, um, distribution infrastructures and how they could improve um, this service. Right? And, and again, as I mentioned, later on, Google is actually doing this service. It's doing, using the caching infrastructure. Um, so, um, let me stop here to see if you guys have any questions. Go ahead. So, I guess those caches that you talked about, they mm -hmm. use just regular policy, uh, least recently used or something? Ours just, for the simulation, we just did five. Okay. We did five, some, five. yeah, yeah, we did some, uh, we did some experiments with least recently used, but it wasn't a, a dramatic improvement. But because of that, you know, it's not, the, the popularity is so different from from all these other services where LIU really works fine, mm -hmm. works well, right? So so this is there's this unpredictability in here um, that is you know hard to manage. So so, so there was there was no significant improve, improvement. In right. Uh, I I guess it was not the focus of the work, but yeah. perhaps uh, there must be something smarter that you can do in terms of uh, checking whether the similar users. Uh, whether users are similar and, and one watches a video and you can catch that video because the other one is going to watch it as well. Right. Actually, there's something smarter. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> Very good question. So, so, I don't know if this is the smart thing you can do, but what we figured out, what, what we then thought afterwards is, you know, um, so first of all, prefetching, right? Um, if you get information already into the cache before the user even starts watching the video, that's again, you know, it shows, it reduces your delay and so on, and probably leads to higher quality and better experience. Um, but it, it, the question is, what to prefetch? Right? What do we, what do we want to get into? So, um, you know, with, with, uh, I, I think I talked about this already in, in, in some detail. But our initial motivation was, you know, this is often what you get when you watch YouTube videos. Right? It's a little wheel turning, but that's not really what we want to watch. Right? And, and uh, actually, it. I think even today, right at noon, uh, Ramesh is going to give a, a, a talk in the systems lunch about the work they had at IMC last year, where they looked at video streams and showed that two seconds of delay or two seconds of buffering already turns users off. They they go away and try to do something. That people cannot wait anymore that long. So if you have a chance and want some free lunch at noon, you should probably go over there. I think am I correct? This is happening today. Did anyone see me here? Right, me today. Okay, so that, that was our initial idea. So we want to, you know, well, that's our idea, but we want to have, want to make sure that's actually the case. Um, so what we did is we, uh, we instrumented clients, or no, we actually asked users to watch YouTube videos, which they're always happy to do, and have Wireshark running so we could get traces, right? Um, so we asked our friends because this was totally not anonymized, so we actually saw what they were watching, right? Um, in a different location. So, so actually, this was me going to a conference, right? So I did this from a whole bunch of websites, right? um, Coffee shop, university, different dorms, and so on. And, and what we did is actually analyzed, you know, how many times, so we asked them to watch, uh, I don't know, I forgot, 10 videos, yeah. And so how many times did the video player actually work fine, and how many times was it disrupted with the button or a long pause in the beginning? And you see my hotel, they had really a terrible internet connection. <laughs> So they ruined the whole statistics a little bit. But, um, so, so we actually found that 41 out of 117 playbacks contain pauses, right? That's a pretty bad number. And we actually continued that a little bit by, by, by changing this a little bit so we could, we had, a, we had a system, we created something that automatically would retrieve YouTube data, and we did a planner lab study. So we all ran this automatically on nodes all over the, all over the world, actually, and it doesn't change, actually. Numbers are really, relatively similar. Uh, we automated that complete and had, and had that happening on, on locations all over the world. And so this is something this is not, which is not great. And so um, what we also saw is that when we analyzed that, that, that 22% contained more than 10 posts, right? 
So you watch a video and it interrupts 10 times. This is totally annoying, especially if you think of YouTube videos being relatively short. So why is this happening? Well, something is happening on the background, right? This, this network is not good enough. Um, maybe server's overloaded, cache is overloaded. It's not in the cache. So, right? so you know, we sit down and said, yeah, how can we improve the user experience? Well, do you have a question? Okay, so, so well, there's, there's one thing. is actually this prefetching, right? If we get, if we can't somehow know what the client wants to watch in the next hour or so, we could get this information already through the cache or through the closest by cache or locally in, into his kind of, you know, local cache, so to speak, and use that information. But how do we know that, right? So the idea is um, <clears throat> that you have like a kind of a prefetching agent that selects this from an architecture, sorry, let me stop. From an architecture point of view, the idea is you have a prefetching agent that selects what videos should be prefetched, and you either select them to your proxy or select them locally on, onto your machine. Right? Um, and so we call these two schemes as the P of clients, which you do, does it directly on the, on the client, and then the P of proxy, the prefetching proxy, which is on, does, does it to a, a proxy that serves a wider range of clients. So these are the two schemes, and these are the naming schemes we approach, and these are the two naming schemes we uh, used here. Um, so, um, and then, you know, the PA determines the videos uh, to be fetched from incoming requests. And what we did is we simply said, let's make use of the recommendation system, right? So when you watch a YouTube video, you always get a list of the referred video list. That's called the referred video list, right? So you have actually 20 videos on that side. And so we said, now what if someone watches a video and we just start prefetching what's on that list? Does that actually improve something? So, um, and we actually looked at two ways. Uh, one is actually when someone did a search, right? You can do the same because you get a list of searches. And then you prefetch a certain number of videos shown on the list, or you can do this for the related videos. And then we did this for up to n videos, and we showed the different n videos. So the advantage of that is it's simple. We don't require any additional data, right? There's no huge collecting of whatever kind of information, global information, APIs, and so on. But how effective is that? Is it really effective, right? You're shaking your head? Yeah, because if you prefetch 20 videos, you just make sure somebody does not watch it. So you wasted lots of time with the prefetching. Let's see. <laughs> it's a good guess. Um, so again, we, t we took the traces we had. We actually got some new traces. They're a little bit more recent, right? They're from 2009 and 2010. Um, you see here the number of requests. This is a very high request. Um, I always explain people here, you, gotta, you know when you do measurements, you got to really look close in your data. So when we took this measurement, this number of requests, really low, right? January 8th, when you're on a US campus, what's usually happening at this time? Everyone's at home, right? This is usually the undergrads at least are not on campus, right? So that was not a good time to make this measurement, we realized afterwards, but you know, we still need data. Um, now you got to think of all this stuff, right? So when you when you do measurements, you can really think these things through, right? There's a lot of things you can do wrong. I can tell you. Um, so um, what we did is also we retrie we retrieved the search result list and the related video lists via the YouTube Data API, right? So we knew actually for each of these of the videos that were requested here, how the list for search looks and what you get on the related list. Right? And so based on that. Um, we, we, start, we use that data for inf information. Now, to come back to your question first, we wanted to see how often um, a, the, the user uses actually the related videos in the search result. Right? And so what you see here is actually um, the two traces, two of the traces we analyzed. We couldn't use the first trace because there was, the header wasn't long enough, so we didn't get some information. So great. Okay, so we can only use two, trace two and three. And so here's the, here's the um, the distribution, right? So if you use it, look at trace two, uh, for over 30%, users use, use the related video list. For um, less than, a little bit less than 30%, they use the search list, uh, and they use YouTube pages and then external list, right? How do we know that? When you get the play URL, there's actually an ampersand and it says search related list or whatever, so it identifies it. I think they use it so YouTube can actually use it, there, do this for their own statistic. Statistic creation of statistics, right? So uh, we see that. So so these are quite 
these are quite often used. Right? And so that, that made us kind of more confident that we can do something with that. Right? Um, <clears throat> and especially since the related listener searches are the most, the, have the highest portion. So <clears throat> the evaluation me methodology here in this case is, um, again, we do trace-based simulation. So we look and we issue these, um, the, 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 the request based on actual user requests. We know videos requested. We know if it has been requested from the related list or from a search. Based on that, we know through the API what would show up on the search or on the related list, and we start pre we simulate a prefetch of this. Right? And so again, the evaluation metric is how many can we serve from the cache based on that approach, right? And we uh, 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 determine the hit rate. And so this is the results we got from the simulation. What you see here is actually we looked at how many of these videos we prefetch on this list. So Catalan says, you know, if you see a if you see a total of 25, right, we prefetch only one, we prefetch five, 10, and so on. Right? So that's the, the simulations we run. And here's the hit rate. And now all of a sudden you see, wow, look at the, um, where's my legend? Um, we, we, this is related videos um, and over N. And we did this with the proxy approach, right? That goes up to a hit rate of, of almost 80%, right? So there is some benefit from that. And I'll actually show you later that if we get to it, that um, Professor Gao over in ECE and her students have analyzed, and we have actually looked at this, that, that people look actually, watch actually multiple videos. So there's a high percentage of people, I think we have analyzed the trailers, some, sometimes something between 40 and 50% where they watch two or more videos in sequence, right? And that's where this is beneficial. Let's, let's go ahead. So if you're paying for fetching at the client end, uh, can't it hurt the performance of the download, the video he's currently watching? Yeah. yeah, yes. But you don't have to necessarily do it exactly at the rate um, as you would play it out, right? <coughs> you can actually do it a little bit slower, right? There's, I have a slide on that in, uh, in, in the end, in, in the rest of the slide. Uh, you see how the different schemes perform? This is the point four is, I think, the regular line where you just would, would use standard caching. In this case, right? You can see that the prefetching really. Now, there's another, let, oh, it comes later, so give me, give me one second. So if you combine um, caching and prefetching, then you get even a, a little bit higher uh, improvement in this case. Right? So if you, if you cache the videos that are requested anyway, and then prefetch what you see on the search and relay list, right? you get a slight improvement. It's not too much, but a slight. So now, uh, what we figured out is what surprised us is actually, we got this very high hit rate, right? But we have only roughly half of the requests are coming actually from the related list in these traces we have, right? But we have an 80% hit rate, that's all the way at the end. And so what we did is actually, we analyzed also where are our requests coming from? So <clears throat> when we have this 80% hit rate, right? You have, uh, when you go all the way to the last column for the n equal to 25, you see that the related list is, is, this, is this blue column and then the yellow dotted column is actually a search result list. So there must, be, there must be some synergy, right? So that, you know, some videos that show up on the search list <coughs> must also be showing up on the related and that's why you get this high hit rate, just when you use the related list. Right? So uh, for, for prefetching, so that's that's just you know the conjecture we draw from that. We don't have a real proof of that, but we, sh we, we since we know when, when we get the hits, where this request originated from, we see that the related video list doesn't make up all this. Right? So there's, there's just some luck, so to speak, right? Because there's some overlap <coughs> to get here. And so that helped us um, and we think also that the recommendation system is, is a good indicator of uh, the topic of interest. So we can use the recommendation system. And it's, it's just, you know, to, so to speak, at our fingertips. The information is just there. It comes down with every web page. And when it goes through a proxy, the proxy can use that information and start the prefetching. Um, we looked at the hit ratios in terms of um, 
where these where these um, different um, hits are coming from, right? So I think this is just a what you've seen before with the bar graphs. I think this is just a different um, version of showing it. So we also looked at the storage requirements here, right? So what you see is how much storage space do you um, do you need? And so what we did is actually here is to get these hit rates, right? We show that you actually that you need most no, more storage. So that's that's the downside of it. You know, if you do basic caching, we can live again with uh, what is this? With a terabyte here, right? Or a little bit lower, actually. But then you would go up to four terabytes or something like this if you did the brief, the full brief, twenty-five brief caching, right? So, um, but 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 what we did is actually one thing um, different to the caching is what we did is since we this, since there's this uncertainty, right? about when you cache a prefix, you don't know if it's really what, when you cache, when you prefetch, if it's really what, we only cache a prefix. So we only cache a certain length of that video, right? So we don't cache it completely. That's how you have this, you know, saving of, you know, too much distance. But then you create your, you know, your additional buffer with that, right? So if you, uh, was it somewhere, did I have, th so 30%, right? Now you get a 30% buffer on your local cache. And now while you start that, you can retrieve the rest of your video and hopefully make the experience as real as possible. Okay. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing. We, so this was like, this was kind of simulations run where we assume we have an infinite storage space and just see when we hit the maximum here. And then we, we, did, uh, we did the same simulation uh, and, and we did the simulation over and over again with different storage sizes and, and looked at our hit rate. So it's just in, in, in just to show uh, how this how it changes when you have not as not the the, the maximum four terabytes uh, yeah four terabytes available but go with smaller storage size right? so um, <clears throat> so I want to I want to go to to something I think this is a little bit more interesting than just the storage size and this is the question of do we actually need to prefetch the whole video and this is just a portion enough. And we went back to our um, local traces we did, right? And we looked at um, the, um, um, the average uh, start buffer size that we would have needed to have a smooth playout. Remember we did this analysis and showed how many pauses we had? Based on that we could say if we had buffered so much data, right, we, wouldn't, we would have had enough in our buffer to to uh, play out this, this this video smoothly, right? With all the mapping effects in the background, and so you can see actually here, in all these cases we had, uh, we averaged it out over the ten videos we looked at, that you know ten percent, thirty, a little bit over thirty. So in one case, and that was my terrible connection, at this at the hotel there, over forty percent. But usually, you know, if you use if you buffer thirty, if you prefetch thirty percent of a video, you're always doing very well. And so, um, th with that, we said, okay, for the for the if you request a video, you cache the whole video, right? Because it's coming into that subnet anyway. There's no extra load for the prefetching. Um, you only take thirty percent of the clip, of the initial thirty percent of the clip. Go ahead. Right. Um, that's a good question. I. Mm, especially for short ones, it might be make, make no sense just to, you know, forget about the percentage and get the whole video. Right? We have we hadn't looked at it, but but that might be interesting to look into. You're absolutely right. So we did an, we did a, a little bit of a simplified analysis and said, okay, here we, is a suppose the prefix size is fifteen percent of the whole video, right? Uh, with with n eleven and caching whole videos and and caching whole videos in addition. Um, we look at you know what happens if you have nothing if you don't do neither prefetching nor caching right and this is our normalized load if we have cache only we know that we have a 40 percent hit ratio the load goes actually down by 40 percent obviously right because some of the requests don't even leave the subnet if you do prefetch only you have a cache rate of 66 percent but you have an overhead of 40 percent right because you load all these prefetch videos that are never watched Right? You, you prefetch all these videos that I actually never watched. And then if you do cache and prefetch and combine it, you have a hit rate of 74%, but only have an overhead of 2%. Right? 
So that's why this is a, we think this is a very efficient, efficient way of improving the viewers, the user behavior. Um, on, on that. Right. Um, so um, we can actually, um, you know, improve that quite a bit by just uh, incurring two percent of additional traffic. So this is, you know, um, one way how we show that, you know, there's actually ways to improve your caching performance by information that's that's out there. Um, we believe that recommendation systems are working very well. So I just want to, you know, I, I didn't have time to go through the third topic I want to talk about. I just want to show you something very quickly where you can even improve that further. So what we did is, we did, we used the same traces as, as we had before, right? These traces I showed you. And um, what we did is now is can we actually go and be the man in the middle and change what we recommend to the final viewer based on what's in the cache, right? Because what your recommended list would go through the cache. And I, I can now on the cache not change what contents is on the list, but change the order on what's on the list. Why do we think that makes sense? Well, first of all, um, we see here, what you see here between these two traces, um, and they have been analyzed, there's, there's, um, there's, there's two papers that are already out there, uh, and then our current one, and they use two different traces in this paper, they use two other different traces in this paper, and then we have one trace for other products. This work here, where you see that, um, where you see that out of these traces, we see that almost 30% or even higher are always coming from the related list in these papers. So it's used quite significantly by the way, right? So with that, we said, well, if this is used so significantly, why, can't, why don't we use that to improve our caching rate? Um, so, so the idea is we reorder the related list based on what's on the cache for you. So you have a related, well, let, me, let me just show you, let me jump ahead, uh, no, before I jump ahead, one more thing I want to do. We analyzed this trace also a little bit further and looked at, um, you know, by through the API we can, we can get the, um, the related list and we can see where the users, what rank the users are re, uh, re, uh, selecting a follow-on video from, right? And here's the CDF of these two traces. And you can actually see, uh, we have marked it here, that you know, for 80% of the requests from the related list, it's from the top 10, right? So the higher the video shows up in the related list, the, the more likely it is that this one is selected. So, so our purpose was actually, we did some analysis, I don't want to go into detail here, I just want to show you the system, is, that if you have a related list that comes from the origin server or from somewhere higher up like this, and you have these videos, you have B, C, and D already in the cache, right? You swap what you sent down to the viewer, right? So B, C, and D come on top and A and E come on, on the bottom. And um, what we did then is we ran this also through with a simulation. And so um, the cache numbers are relatively low here, right? This is, um, Again, the, 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 the hit rate here, right? But if you see, and, and don't just look at the position centric here for this analysis. If you see, if you don't know, if you do no reordering, you have a 6.7% cache rate. If you do reordering, you double on, you almost double that. Right? Same here. It's even it's even more significant for the second trace one. It's, it's like five, no, four times higher. Right? Um, and so that shows you actually that with this little trick here, because by analyzing the user behavior, you can even further improve that, right? Because I think it's a kind of a natural behavior, you kind of click more on top. It seems like users are very lazy, they don't care too much about exactly what the content is, they just want to click uh, on that, on, on what's high up. Yeah, go ahead. So video results actually come from a real experiment where you reorder things or are you no. just assuming that no. users are clicking? Very good. To Very good. Big caveat on that. This is our this is our expectation, right? We don't have a we don't have a real experiment. So what we'd like to do now, and as soon as my student has implemented this, I would like it to invite you guys. We will reveal this to everyone. Um, we are thinking of building a little proxy, right? That does nothing else than changing the related list and see what the user so what you would have to do is redirect your browser for this experiment, or watch a couple of videos, and show how you, how you go through this. 
And so hopefully with that, we would get more, some more uh, detail on, on the USB rig. In this case, in the simulation, that's, that's probably the, the biggest drawback on that, is we, we, you know, we cannot, since, we're not, since, we, since YouTube doesn't allow us to do that, it's hard for us to analyze that, right? Um, what I'm not showing you here is actually we did a, we did a bunch more of um, background analysis. Is, is you, is you, is YouTube, can we see if YouTube is maybe doing something like this already? We couldn't find any indications. Um, but we also were concerned about when do you get back to a loop by doing this, right? So, so how often do you actually click on videos from the related list until you come back to the video that you already, that you have selected in the in initially? Um, that's happening all the time already, right? So we just did again different sets of me measurements, even plan lab to see, we call that how the loop count, right? Um, if you're interested, uh, I can show you quickly here. We did a, we did a loop count study. Um, you see we used the different regions in Planet Lab. And actually, this is just taking, you know, positions for the 100 videos we requested. <coughs> we're using the same position over and over again. So we're just saying we're using a very dump user. So if you use position four all the time, right? You, after four videos, after not applying our scheme, just what using, using YouTube is using today, after four videos, you come back to the original video. Again, right? So there's not much variety actually. In those videos. So that's maybe why it also, what, what we've shown for, before, helps us with this increasing efficiency. That's what we did. Okay, um, so I hope I could show you a little bit of, you know, the challenges we have today in, 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 in video streaming systems. Uh, multimedia streaming systems, I should say. It's not just video streaming, but there's, there's games. There's now, um, you know, kind of this, this um, sm uh, small uh, or thin client approaches where you stream just the frames. Um, and uh, what the challenges on the server side are, but also what the challenges in the whole distributed system side are, how you can actually use observed systems and use that information to think about new ideas to improve the performance of your system. Um, I'd be happy to take any additional questions you guys have. Also, I sit two minutes walking distance from here in the Nodes Engineering base, uh, Building. If you ever have any questions, you're more than welcome to stop by and uh, talk to me. Any questions? Then have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.